we have themes for our various sashin, partly because the human mind becomes bored with the same thing over and over again if we just called it January sashin, February sashin, March sashin. So people think they're getting something new if we give it a theme, which is in a way true, because there are so many practices, there are so many tools within Buddhism, to, so to spend a whole sashin out of doors is a wonderful thing. To spend a whole sashin on loving kindness practice is a wonderful thing. And the theme of this sashin is grasses, trees, and the great earth. And the purpose of the sashin is to become, to become grasses, trees, and the great earth. The purpose of this sashin is to let go of being a human being. To let go of being a human being. To let go of our obsession with our human mind and our human body and our human emotions. And to open to another mind and another body, our true mind and our true body. The purpose of this sashin is to let go of being human. To let go of our obsession with this particular, born into this time, human body, human mind, constellation of human feeling, and to open to our great body, our great mind, our great heart. Dogen Zenji writes, mountains and rivers right now are the actualization of the ancient Buddha way. Mountains and rivers right now are the actualization of the ancient Buddha way. This room, these lanterns, this ceiling, those crickets, right now are the actualization of the ancient Buddha way. Both mountains and rivers abide in their true form and actualize true virtue. True virtue. Jogen, 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 our Jogen, tells me that the word virtue is a difficult word for the current younger generations, the X's and the millennials, that they're allergic to the word virtue. But it's a wonderful word, virtue. When we ponder it, as, as Dogen Zenji says, about mountains and rivers, what does that mean? That mountains and rivers have true virtue actualize true virtue. And what does that mean for virtue in our lives? Mountains and rivers transcend time and are alive in the eternal present. Mountains and rivers transcend time and are alive in the eternal present. They are the original self and they are emancipation realization. Mountains are high and wide the movement of clouds, and the inconceivable power of soaring in the wind comes freely from the mountains. As always, Dogen Zenji is talking at several levels. He's talking about actual mountains and rivers, the environment in which he lived. If you visit Aheji, it's way up in the mountains with wonderful cold running streams. He's talking about physical mountains and rivers, but he's talking about something deeper too. Something that is solid, stable, something that is always flowing. Letting go of our human mind and merging with mountains, rivers, blades of grass, the mesmerizing pattern of shifting leaves when we lie under a tree and look up, the chattering and groaning of trees pushed about by the wind. All of these, any of these, because they originate from our true body-mind, can speak to us directly of our body and mind. 
and bring us to clear understanding. If we let go and enter their awareness fully, we can enter the eternal present and actualize the ancient way. If we can let go of our human awareness, our narrow human awareness, and enter the awareness of mountains, trees, grasses, crickets, the wind, we can enter their awareness fully. We enter the eternal present and we actualize the ancient way. Dogen Zenji says, entering the forest without stirring the grasses, entering the water without setting up waves, entering the forest without stirring up grasses, entering water without stirring up waves. What does this mean? What is stirring up waves all the time? Looking back on my life, people often ask, when did you begin to meditate? And my first memory of meditating is when I was about maybe seven. And I decided that I wanted to get the chickadees to eat out of my hand during the winter. This is in upstate New York. And so I got into my snow suit and my snow boots and my mittens. And I got some bread. And I went outside and I sat under a bush with bread in my hand. And I knew instinctively that if they knew that I was a human being offering them bread, they wouldn't come. So I knew that I had to withdraw my humanness completely and be like the snow, be like the bush, and sit absolutely still, barely breathing, and certainly not thinking human thoughts not thinking thoughts of, I hope they'll come. (laughs) So that's the kind of meditation we need in the forest to withdraw our human thoughts and let the 10,000 dharmas, the 10,000 grasses, the 10,000 tree leaves, the 10,000 sounds emerge and manifest true nature, eternal presence. Dogen Zenji says, manifest the eternal present, but it's also manifesting the eternal presence. And if we're so so busy being present as ourselves, we cannot be aware of the eternal presence. The exercise that Hogan led during the inner critic workshop last weekend is an excellent way to help us realize the limitations of our human mind and realize what kind of mind we're in. Sun Tzu Nim, the great Korean master, who was a good friend of my teacher, Mizumi Roshi, used to talk about different kinds of mind. Don't know mind was one of his favorites, which many people have picked up in the years. Don't know mind. So to know, am I in don't know mind or not? Am I in no, no, no mind? I know, I know, I know, and you're wrong. No, 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 mind. Oh, I'm in, I'm in a not very helpful mind. I'm in a suffering mind. Let me step into don't know mind. Or he had just try mind. Which, oh, I can't do that. Just try mind and so on. So we need to know with what Dan Brown calls our metacognitive awareness, awareness which is overarching awareness and knows, recognizes what's going on in our mind. We all have it or we couldn't recognize, oh, my mind just thought this, or oh, my mind just wandered away. We all have metacognitive awareness. So with metacognitive awareness, we can realize, oh, What mind am I in now? 
As Hoban pointed out, our small mind is obsessed with I, me, mine, and my predicament, as Eckhart Tolle so beautifully pantomimes. My predicament. You can see people caught up in their predicament. You just look at them, oh, that person's caught up in my predicament. But who makes up the predicament? When we're obsessed with my predicament, we confine ourselves to a small box, a prison of our own making, where we become blind to what is here all the time to see. As Mazumi Roshi used to say, it's so obvious. Almost every Dharma talk he would say, it's so obvious. <laughs> when we put ourselves in that small box, we become blind to what is here. So obvious, here to see, right here, right now. We don't need to be in the forest, but it helps. Because people created things, remind us of people, which reminds us that we're people, and then the thinking mind starts. In that box, we're also deaf to what is here to hear, what is right here to hear, to be heard. And unable to fear, unable to feel what we're actually touching. So right now, what are you actually touching? Can you feel it? And can you feel what is touching you? What are you touching and what is touching you? How do we divide that up? We disconnect from what is actually our individual body, but even more so from our true body. When we disconnect, then we feel lonely. We feel out of place. We feel useless in the world. We feel unhappy without exactly knowing why. The Buddha said why. The Buddha said we feel unhappy because we haven't truly merged with impermanence. We haven't found tools to help us step out of our suffering, and we haven't acknowledged that our self is not the self we think it is, and we haven't entered our true self, would be the Zen extension of that. Fundamentally, we feel unhappy because we think we're separate, and of course we are separate, but when we focus only on that separation, then we're miserable. And then we feel unhappy because we feel separate and disconnected and lonely and useless and a stranger in a strange land. And then we either blame ourselves or blame others or both, usually. And that makes us feel more disconnected. And so the cycle goes. So let's try this exercise just briefly that Hogan recommended. Maybe you've all tried once, but we can try it here too. So stepping into the small mind of I, me, mine, and thinking of my problems. These are my problems. This is my predicament. These are my body's problems. These are my mind's problems. These are my work problems. These are my relationship problems. This is my to-be-accomplished list. These are my failings. So entering that mind. And just see from the inside, how does it feel? How does it feel in the heart? How does it feel in the body? How does it feel in the mind? Go over our predicament. Somebody likes me, somebody doesn't like me. I like somebody, I don't like somebody. I'm angry at somebody. They said something to me I don't like. The world is not fair to me. If only I were more, if only I were less. Okay, now we switch to a somewhat wider mind, 
which we might think is, oh, this is a very, I'm so broad. I think about the whole world, I'm so broad. I think about all the problems in Afghanistan and Iraq and terrorists and politics and liberation for women and child abuse, whatever. Bring in all the problems of the world. Pile them all into your mind and then become aware of how does that feel. And does that way of feeling in body, heart, and mind, does that help the world? Or is that adding one more suffering person to the world? Now letting go of that, letting go of I, me, mine, and my predicament, letting go of all the problems in the world, we enter this place and this time. And we switch, we can switch our mind to open awareness. What at this moment is fine? What at this moment is even pleasant? What at this moment is totally in its place? Sometimes we can feel a little trickle of guilt. Oh, I shouldn't feel this way when there are so many problems in the world. I shouldn't feel at ease. I shouldn't feel contented. But think. All of us will act in some place in the world. All of us will act in some way to help others. Is it better to act from this awareness? From this place of serenity and contentment? Is it better to find our place and act from this place to help the world? Or is it better to be an I, me, mind or all the problems of the world mind? When we do our work in the world. It's an interesting paradox. We have to completely accept things as they are before we can act in a skillful way to change them. As long as we're angry and resisting, that anger and that resistance will enter into our work and cause problems and cause karmic repercussions. So we have to find this place of Complete acceptance, not, oh yeah, I guess I have to accept it, acceptance, but complete ease and acceptance. This is the way things are. And in the next instant, they will change. From that place, we do our our work in the world. We talk all the time about being in the present moment. We strive to bring our mind to the present moment. But we can detect around the edges there is still someone striving. There is still in and out of the present moment. Hogan always says, there is no out of the present moment. (laughs) We are always in the present moment. True, but our awareness can be somewhere else, right? When we actually settle in the present moment, it's so spacious, so rich, so wonderful. There is something beyond striving. There is something 
beyond the much-touted present moment. Dogen Zenji says it in the Mountains and Rivers Sutra. Water is not concerned with past, future, present, or the phenomenal world. And he's talking about water and something deeper than water. Not concerned with past, future, present. Not concerned with present or the phenomenal world. We know what he's talking about when we say, oh, now I'm in the present moment. Ha. Huh. <laughs> Who said that? And where were they? And wait a minute, a present moment went by while I was thinking I was in the present moment, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there is something beyond awareness of the present moment. Water is not concerned with past, future, present, or the phenomenal world. Even in a drop of water, innumerable Buddha lands appear. In this sashin, sitting outside all by yourself, with no one around you, you can see the mind in clear relief. The first time Kojin went up in the treehouse, and she's one of, there's only a few people who really love sitting in the treehouse. Hoban is one of them. But Kojin loves sitting in the treehouse. The first time she went up and she came down after a week in the treehouse. I mean, this means a week in a platform about the size of you know, four by four Zabutan. The first time she came down, she said it was wonderful. She said, Every time my mind would come up with some kind of judgment or criticism, I would realize, where did that come from? There's nobody up here. <laughs> <laughs> because she could see the mechanism, you know, the mind that just generates all this stuff. Sitting outside by yourself, you can see the mind in clear relief. There is no one around to stir up thoughts. And you can see how thoughts just keep arising. And you can decide to follow them or turn away from them. You can see how unhelpful and even silly most of them are. So last night I was sitting outside in the forest, and I, I just like to watch my mind and, and, and uh, you know, catch it at its work. So the mind says something like this. I wonder if I could survive in the forest if I got lost. Because last week I read about somebody who was lost for five days <coughs> in the forest, and they found him just in time. If it got cold tonight, how would I keep warm? Well, deer, they kind of ball up in a little ball. Maybe if I balled up in a little ball. But they have hoofs, and their hoofs don't get cold. And uh, The search party would be very surprised to find me alive after five days. Maybe I'd be on the evening news. Maybe they would ask me to be on the Survivor show. And <laughs> but what would I eat? Mm, maybe I need to read more about edible plants in the Pacific Northwest. And what about something to drink? If it doesn't rain and that stream is dried up, you know, could I drink my own urine if I really came down to it? And, you know, the mind just goes on and on and on. And then suddenly, oh, what's that noise? Suddenly alert. What's that noise? What that, is that a cougar coming? OK, maybe if I sit really, really, really still, they won't know I'm here. OK, I'm going to be one with the trees, one with the trees, one with the trees, one with the trees. Oh, no, I'm breathing out. Maybe you can smell my breath. Don't breathe. <gasps> <laughs> Is he gone? Maybe I'll be on the evening news when they find half my eaten body. <laughs> then who would come to my funeral? And How would they like dress my body for the funeral, which is only half there? <laughs> Who would let my Facebook friends know that I died? And <laughs> you, know, you know how the mind it just goes on and on and on. It's just like so if somebody were in the room sitting next to you talking that way, you would leave the room. <laughs> really? really? I, my sister had a mother-in-law who, who had verbal diarrhea. I mean, she would just talk, and you could literally leave the room and come back, and she would still be talking. <laughs> and that's what our mind is like. 
give it a rest. From the age of 18 months, we've been thinking. Somehow we believe it's necessary to make us happy, to be thinking all the time. The mind has convinced us that if it's thinking all the time, we'll be safe, we'll stay healthy, we won't die yet, and we'll be happy, and we'll be loved. The mind has convinced us that that's the way to do it. But actually, as we find from sitting, the opposite is true. Is when we're not thinking, when we're not thinking, when we're immersed in not thinking. When we take the backward step, in the sutra, Dogen Zenji talks about walking backwards. And he often, he he talks about that in Fukan Zazengi, Instructions for Doing Zazen. Take the backward step, turn the mind within, as Hoban talked about yesterday. Turn the mind into this amazing world inside here and turn the mind through then. You know, we can be obsessed, become obsessed by turning the mind within too. But turn the mind, when we turn the mind in, truly turn the mind in with that clarity that comes with Zazen, we we see through, we pierce through the self and we see into everything else. The self becomes transparent and everything else becomes transparent and glowing, brilliant, alive. When we're not thinking, when we're totally immersed in awareness or even in doing, when we're totally immersed in doing without thinking, then we feel truly alive and happy. When we're running, when we're dancing, when we're improvising music, when we're absorbed in painting or working with clay, when we're surfing, when we're hiking, when we're enjoying cooking, all of these activities. When we're past the point of thinking, when we're just doing, then we feel happy. Then we feel we belong on this earth. We belong in this life. And this is what we keep calling coming home. We're coming to realize that we are at home. We are always at home. It is our minds that separate us from that home. Home is where the heart is. Home is where the body is. And where ceaseless thinking is not. Home is where we are relaxed. Where awareness takes the place of thinking. And thinking shrinks down and sits in its true corner. As Dogen said, she says, it's like looking through a bamboo tube at a tiny part of the sky. Yeah, let thinking become a tiny part of the huge sky of awareness. People ask me, do you think or are you practicing with a clear mind all the time, all of the time? Of course I think. I have a mind. I think all kinds of thoughts, but most of them are not useful. And I do have the ability, after years of practice, to turn the mind off. And then it turns itself back on again. That is its habit. Hmm? Some are useful, like, I have one hour to get this talk written, so let's get moving. Or I need to fire the tiles tonight, so they'll be ready for glazing on Thursday. That kind of thought, just like simple statement of fact, that's useful thought. But many, many thoughts that my mind generates are not useful, a total waste of energy. So catching those and stopping those can really revivify us. When I catch them, I either try to ignore them or I'd be amused by them. Like, I can't find my, I love to catch my mind at this one. I can't find my blank, where did I last have it, is a useful thought. But when the mind adds, I wonder if somebody took it. (laughs) I love to catch my mind at that one. It has never been true yet. But my mind keeps, 
Like I walked, I just, I caught myself. I walked in for this talk. I looked at my place and my Zaku was gone. <laughs> and I thought, did I leave my Zaku outside? No, I know I brought it back in. Where's and I and I hadn't slipped over into somebody took my Zaku. <laughs> <laughs> when I realized, oh, of course, it's my Dharma talk, it's up here, right? <laughs> So we have to know when we cross over into a thought that is invalid and not useful. And most thoughts, frankly, fit into that category when we aren't practicing and being aware of thoughts. One of our Sangha members did a very interesting practice. She took on an entire category of thoughts that were not useful, complaints. And she began to notice them, label whenever a complaint arose. And then she marked, she marked, oh, a complaint by switching a bracelet to the other arm. And she would post <laughs> on Facebook, I've only been awake for half an hour and I've already switched it three times. <laughs> Which is true of all of us, right? If we take a category of afflictive thoughts, afflictive thoughts, meaning they afflict us with discomfort, with unhappiness, and they afflict people around us with unhappiness. Take a category of afflictive thoughts like, who stole my blank, or complaint, and we just watch it. We dog it. We stay with it. We bring it up into the light of awareness. It will change. When it's unconscious or barely conscious, it doesn't have a chance to change. We can't really work with it. So you can note, and you get to notice them faster and faster. Oh, that's a complaint, because you can feel the, the sort of body and feeling tone around it when it arrives. Ah, complaint. And you can set it aside faster without getting tangled up in it. Occasionally, when my mind is quiet, I have some interesting thoughts that arise in a different manner than the flow stream of background thoughts. You've all had these. They pop into the mind like a surprise. We call them insights. Isn't it strange that we need to have a whole session and that people pay to come and sit out in the forest? But it's actually not strange when you look at why we need this. For 200,000 years, we evolved in accord with nature. In the grasslands, in the forests, in the jungles. Indigenous people feel that they are a part of nature. You know, we admire the Native Americans for that quality, that they feel that they are a part of nature. And they request, actually, of a deer or even a plant May I have your life in order to nourish my life? But as we, as human beings, have begun to live in boxes, and boxes are very useful, we have begun to regard nature as a problem, something to fight, or even a danger. And nature can be dangerous, but that way of feeling about nature begins to pervade our minds. Oh, it's an inconvenience. Oh, it's hot today. It's too hot. I love T-O-O, too hot. That's a complaint, right? Mm -hmm. There have been cities in the last few thousand years. People have accumulated and lived in cities like Rome and Ur and Abayagiri in Sri Lanka, all over the world, different continents. There have been large cities with as many as a million people living in them. But even as recently as 100 years ago, only two out of 10 people lived in towns or cities, lived in urban areas. Everybody else lived out completely surrounded by nature. Now, over half of people live in urban areas. 
And in a few decades, it'll be 70% of people live in urban areas. So we just keep moving away, away, away from what is our natural environment and finding it more and more uncomfortable or something that we have to plan an excursion into. This is a quote from Urban Studies. Before cities, the last major chain change in settlement patterns was the accumulation of hunter-gatherers into villages several thousand years ago. Village culture is characterized by common bloodlines, intimate relationships, and communal behavior. Common bloodlines, intimate relationships, and communal behavior. Whereas urban culture is characterized by distant bloodlines, unfamiliar relations, and competitive behavior. Distant bloodlines, unfamiliar relations, and competitive behavior. Separation alienation, suffering. The cure, our mind says, think more. Think about this problem of cities. Or our mind says, well, just go to more parties or rock concerts. Then you'll be happy in a city. But we're aware that being in our natural environment may help. This could happen in cities. You can go to parks, right? Lots of cities have nice parks. Portland has nice parks. However, notice that in man-made environments, like parks, we still keep our critical minds going, our mind of separation, our mind of complaint. Why don't they clean up all this trash? They should update the play equipment. They should add a tennis court or a swimming pool, etc., etc. Somehow, in nature, we're able to let that mind go. We don't go out in the forest and think, why are these trees so messy? <laughs> They're dropping leaves and twigs everywhere. Right? The thought doesn't even cross our mind. We don't think, oh, this forest needs improvement. We should um, update the decor by planting a canary palm, or we need a bed of Dutch tulips in here. <laughs> no, the forest is the forest. When we enter the forest, we enter the mind of the forest, which is as it is. And yet, we can still find our minds wandering into forest improvement. Each, each, every August when we do this session, I find that when I'm sitting in the forest, my mind starts thinking, we should add some more sitting platforms under my favorite tree. Or up in the trees, but not so high as the tree house, just you know, a little ladder up. So we have to catch ourselves and laugh and let go and enter the mind of the forest. Let go of the human mind and enter the mind of the grasses, trees, and the earth beneath us. People have asked about walking practice since we're just doing sitting practice. Hmm. I, I would say um, look at why you would like to do walking practice rather than sitting practice. Look at the mind that arises during sitting practice versus walking practice. There is walking practice when you walk out to your sitting place, so do that as practice. Mm -hmm. And there is walking back from your sitting place, which is walking practice. Remember that that is a time for walking practice. One of the difficulties with doing walking practice while others are doing seated practice is that you, you can come in front of people or they catch you out of the corner of their eye when you're moving, and it's distracting for people who are sitting quietly. There are some situations and some states of mind where the mind is so active 
that a person cannot sit still but wants to keep practicing. The person is so agitated. And agitation comes up, by the way. To me, agitation during a session is a wonderful sign. This always means that something that needs to be dropped away is arising. And the system is shaking. The system is agitated about that because it doesn't know what it is. And something, something is emerging that will either be realized in the mind or just dropped away. And so that agitation is very important to stay with. And if the only way you can stay with that agitation is to do walking meditation, then find a place where you're not in anybody's line of sight. So maybe close to the monastery, uh, walking back and forth in the grass would work. But in general, sitting still, especially when you sit still in the forest all by yourself, you can wiggle your toes if you want, you can shift position if you want. But you know, Kilgan once said something that I thought was so intelligent and so simple. And people were asking him, oh, what do, how, do you, how do you sit with pain? He said, sit until you feel like I can't sit one minute longer and then sit a bit longer. Because there may be something on the other side of that, I can't sit a bit longer. And I would say the same thing too, when the, when the feeling arises, I must move, even when you're out in the forest and you have total leeway to move because nobody's watching you, sit a little longer. Sit a little longer. See if you can get over that hump and see if there's something on the other side. And then, of course, you can always move. We want to keep stretching ourselves because our tendency is to keep collapsing. Whether it's our mind collapsing back into I, me, mine, or especially as we get older, oh, I can't do that. I'm not able to do that. Fortunately, our practice keeps stretching us. Allow that to happen. Dogen Zenji says, human beings only see water as water. Water is seen as dead or alive, depending upon the mind of the beholder. Do we see nature as something dead or half dead, something to carve up and manipulate? Are stones dead? Are fallen tree trunks dead? We have to investigate this for ourselves. Dogen Zenji says over and over, investigate this for yourself. Ascertain this for yourself. Do we accept nature as it is? Does nature accept us as we are? We have to investigate this. How does a tree perceive us? If you truly enter the awareness of the tree from the very top leaves, branches and leaves, all the way down to the deepest roots, what is the awareness of the tree? And how does it perceive us? As Thich Nhat Hanh says, what we call our self is made up of non-self pieces, non-self elements. In this session, we can let go of what we call our self and merge our awareness with what we usually call non-self elements, the thousand grass blades, the shimmering trees, the huge earth, and all it contains. I often think that if you had to pick one practice that would sustain you all your life and keep you in big mind, it would be constant awareness of the earth. Here we are, this little tiny little speck on top of this enormous earth. So it's very interesting if you start thinking of this, being aware of the earth and then <coughs> being aware of the grass, like a pelt, a soft pelt, and all the little people and things on the earth. Make your awareness like the earth. If all of this disappeared, our non-self elements disappeared, we could not exist long enough to recognize its disappearance. The trees breathe out and make the breath that we breathe in, the breath that we need to live. And we breathe out and make the breath that the trees breathe in and need to live out of us and into them, out of them and into us. It's constant CPR. It's happening all the time, and we ignore it. Through practice, we become 
like snails, carrying our home with us. When we sit like this for five or six days, letting go, letting go again and again and again of the small human mind, merging with the body and mind of mountains, rivers, grasses, and the great earth, day after day, hour after hour, we begin to be able to carry the mind of grasses, trees, and the great earth with us, with us, wherever we go, a dependable refuge inside of us. Tarun Zenji says, mountains have been the abode of great sages from the limitless past to the limitless present. Wise people and sages all have mountains in their inner chamber as their body and mind. Wise people and sages all have mountains in their inner chamber as their body and mind. You may think that in mountains many wise people and great sages are assembled. But after entering the mountains, not a single person meets another. There is just the activity of mountains. There is no trace of anyone having entered the mountains. Although mountains belong to the nation, mountains belong to people who love them. Mountains don't know that there's a line down their side, and one side is Germany and one side is France. Mountains belong to the people who love them. You should know that mountains are fond of wise people and sages. Please enter the mountains and let the mountains enter you and inhabit your inner chamber. Investigate. Are the trees fond of you or indifferent? Open your awareness and find out. <laughs>